Well, hey friends, uh, my name is Mike Lamps and I'm lead pastor here at New Ground if we haven't met each other. I know this is a little different than what normal is, uh, but I'm returning from a convention late tonight and want to continue our series in the Shema with you. What we say every single week to start our worship, it'd be good to go through this prayer. We're about halfway through the series, so pretty excited about today talking about the word heart. So open your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 6. We're going to just read in English just a little bit of part of the Shema uh, that we know. And this is how it goes. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Let's pray together. God, I pray in these few moments that my words would be your words, that you give us a fresh understanding of what this word heart meant to the Israelites and how that has influence and how we are to live uh, with all, um, to love you with all of our heart today. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen. So I was talking with a new acquaintance of mine that I met at one of the Chamber of Commerce meetings about a couple weeks ago, and he volunteers with the Swahili speaking community uh, and working with refugees that are in Grand Rapids. And what was interesting was hearing him talk about the struggles that the refugees have um, in acclimating to life in America. And a couple of things stood out. One of them wasn't surprising. The other one was very surprising that I never even thought about before. The first thing that wasn't surprising was about cars. He said they walk and bike everywhere. So to be able to drive a car was a tremendous task in itself and usually considered a luxury where these refugees are from. Um, Even more so, it's not only learning how to drive a car, it's also making sure that you don't get in an accident, realizing this thing is a lethal weapon if misused, right? And so it was very difficult to try to teach those who are not used to driving cars to do that. That wasn't surprising to me. What was surprising to me was he said the word doors. I'm like, doors? He's like, yeah, doors. The buildings that they have back home don't have any doors. They're just open. And so the fact that there's a door is just an unusual thing for those, uh, these particular refugees. And not only that, the, it's even more confusing when you don't know whether to push or pull on the door. I don't know if you've had that problem. I've had that problem sometimes where you go to the door and you push it and you're supposed to be pulling it. I wasn't reading the signs, of course, what have you, but That happens sometimes, right? Imagine you have problems with pushing and pulling doors. Imagine what someone who's not even used to doors at all has. That was a really surprising thing of of just basic understandings of how that works. And that's one of many things that he had talked about, but it was really fascinating to talk about the things that we take for granted or things that we just assume are a natural part of daily life. And I mentioned these examples today because I think in a lot of ways that is what I think about when I hear the word heart and soul in the Shema. The word for heart is called lev, and the word for soul is called nefesh. We'll talk about soul next week. So today we're going to talk about heart, but both of these words, even in English, people think heart and soul kind of mean the same thing, and they don't. And not only that, what we think heart means normally for us is not what the Israelites would have thought of heart. And the word for nephesh, soul, what we think of soul, is not what the Israelites would have thought about soul either. So this week we're going to walk through what this word lev, this word heart, means. And, you know, when we talk about the heart, usually it's kind of like the seat of our deepest passions, right? When we talk about you've got heart, right? It's almost like something, you, you might you might use language like I have a gut feeling. Usually that gut feeling is something that comes from the heart, right? So it's something that we think about when we think of the word heart. Now, what's interesting is we know a lot more about the human body than the Israelites did. Something that's really interesting is that the Israelites didn't even know what a brain was. They didn't even, they didn't even think about it even existing. They didn't know about a heart. They knew the heart was an organ that sustained and kept life going. They knew that much about it. But that was, that, that was pretty much all about the human body that they really do. They didn't know anything about the brain. They didn't even use it. So even to say, you know, in the mind, they had a word for that. It was much different. But even that meant something completely different. They just didn't have any concept of the thing, the organ inside your head that involves everything about thinking 
and and making decisions and such. So I know it's it's hard to to understand that. Wait, you don't know what a brain is? I mean, that's something that's very basic to us, right? I mean, the brain is the house of the intellect, of the mind, right? That's what we know about. Um, but what the Israelites talk about heart, there's multiple layers to this. In fact, um, there's even mention of a heart attack in, in Scripture. If you look at 1 Samuel 25, talking about uh, Nabal, it says um, that whose heart died inside him, and he became like stone. That's like a mention of a heart attack. So they knew that the heart had some sort of uh, importance in sustaining life and, and pumping blood and such. But since the Israelites didn't have any concept of a brain, and when we mention brain, we think intellect and mind, when they say the word heart, they believe that the heart is also where intellectual activity took place. For example, when King Solomon asked God for wisdom to discern between right and wrong, it says this, So give your servant a discerning heart, that's lev, to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? For us, that's usually something that we associate with the mind, right? We say our brains, our mind would make those choices and discern wisdom. Even knowledge, when you talk about just knowing things, for an Israelite, that also comes from the heart. Deuteronomy 8, just a couple chapters later, says this. You know with your levav, your lev, that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord, your God, disciplines you. Lev, levav is heart. Your heart also becomes the seat of how you understand everything and how you make connections to the world and to life in, in general. Job 17 says this. You have closed their lev, their heart, to understanding, therefore you will not let them triumph. So for the Israelites, our heart is really where we think and make sense of the world. And that is usually for us, which we would usually attribute to your brain, or even use the word mind. The Israelites don't even know that exists. So they use the word heart, lev, instead. But like we've said the last several weeks in this series about the ancient Hebrew language, it's a very small amount of words, right? So the words have multiple layers of meaning. The same goes for heart. Um, heart isn't just about making sense of things or, it, you know, making decisions and such. They would also say, and this might make more sense to us in a lot of ways, it's also where you experience joy. If you think about the incredible moments in your life, maybe, maybe you have these bucket list items. You want bucket list items, right? Those, those, those things that you want to do in your life that are just epic, that you want to do sometime before uh, your life on this, on this particular uh, stage of earth ends. Uh, you want to do those items. For me and my wife, going to a Coldplay concert live was one of those bucket lists. We checked that off in May. That was really cool. Just incredible moments that just brought us sheer joy. Maybe you've experienced something similar to that in your life. Some of you might even say that it even touched your soul, which we're going to talk about next week, which is not what the Israelites would understand soul to be. We'll get to that next week. So much fun, but because uh, that's not necessarily how they would use that. But in, in ancient Hebrew, even the word happiness, when you use the word happiness, is described as being good of heart, is how they would describe happiness. Maybe you've read in the scriptures or heard the scriptures say they have a heart of joy, right? So there's something to be said about experiencing joy as relates to the heart. So what we have is the heart being the center of our physical life, right? They understood that as an organ that pumps blood and gives life that way. We also have the heart being the center of the intellect or the mind or what we would call a brain, and we also have the heart being the center of where all our choices come from, right? We talked about Solomon being motivated by your desires. Even when we're talking about affections, they use the word heart. Psalm 37 says the desires of your heart, talking about affection. When Nathan is talking to King David, that you know when he really wants something, he should go after it. He says this to him. He says, whatever is in your heart, your lev, Go do it, he says in 2 Samuel. So in essence, for an Israelite, the heart is the center of every part of human existence. It's the center of everything. 
You, you probably heard this verse before if you've been around church long enough, but now it might have a little bit of a different and new and fresh meaning. Psalm, or Proverbs 4.23. It says, above all else, guard your what? Your love, your heart. Guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. So the heart is the center of everything in human existence. Now, the scripture also testifies that there's a problem with our hearts. And it's one that the, the prophet Jeremiah testifies to, that our hearts are fundamentally broken. And in fact, listen to what Jeremiah says in chapter 17 of his book. He says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I mean, this is why scripture is so emphatic on how we need a total transformation of our hearts. Moses got really aggressive with the way he described it and said the heart needed circumcised. Some of you are familiar with what circumcision is, right? Listen to what he says in Deuteronomy uh, later on in the book. He says, the Lord God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and live. I mean, you do know what circumcision is. And if you don't, you can ask someone. It just involves a little surgical procedure. We'll just leave it at that. So surgery, that's pretty aggressive, right? That is what Moses is talking about, the Lord doing to our hearts, circumcising them, doing surgery. That's a major event that happens for a heart, right? You get the picture. A transformation of the heart. I mean, Moses is saying that's what God wants to do with the evil that's in there because we're fundamentally broken. He wants to take that stuff out. Even David, King David, when he murdered Bathsheba's husband, he committed adultery with her, you know, he got her pregnant. He says something that we often quote uh, in churches that I hear a lot. Psalm 51.10, you've probably heard this verse before if you've been around church long enough. He says, create in me a clean, what? Heart, lev, a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. So a transformation of the heart. If you're with us in January, we, did a, we started a series on Ezekiel, I'm talking about a new heart, right? And Ezekiel, if you remember, hoped that God would remove our heart of stone and replace it with a, heart, a new heart of flesh. And then Jeremiah even hopes that God would write the commands of Torah on the levs, on the hearts of his people. So now that we understand this heart, we, now that we understand that the heart is the center of all human existence and that it is fundamentally broken and God is interested in transformation of the heart, now let's go back to the Shema and talk about what this means for us, about loving the Lord with all of our heart. So when we say, love the Lord your God with all your heart, it means that we're to love God with all of our body and all of our mind, with all all of our feelings and desires and with all of our failures and our future choices. That's pretty much everything, right? <laughs> but, but usually we look at the Shema, that verse, heart, soul, and strength, or heart, soul, and might, and think that's everything. But the heart is the center of all human existence already in that one word alone, your body, your mind, your feelings, your desires, your failures. I love that, your failures even. Love God in your failures. Love God in your future choices. That is all part of what loving our God with our hearts is. I mean, that's like everything, right? You remember last week we talked about the word love, ahava, right? When we recognize that part of ahava is about action, right? It's not just about loving someone in your mind. It's about doing something about action. In fact, we talked about there's no statement that says God is love in the Hebrew Bible. God's love is proved by his mighty acts for his people. So now we can ask a few questions about us, about living out the Shema in relation to loving God with all our hearts. So maybe you can ask these questions this week. How am I living God's love with my body or with my mind, my feelings, my desires, my failures, my future choices? I mean, that's a lot. I mean, that's everything, right? That's a lot of stuff there. 
And that's the Shema, friends. Jesus says later on that that this Shema, I mean, he says that we say it every single week here at New Ground. It is part of the greatest commandment. He says all the scripture, all the law and the prophets, all the Torah and the prophets are summed up in this commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your might. So Jesus says that loving God with all your heart, with your body and mind, with your feelings and desires, right? With your failures and your future choices, that is all part of living out Torah, of living out the scripture, of living out what it means to live out the salvation life, to love God with all of our hearts. So maybe this week you can ask yourself, how can I love God with any of these six things this week? You don't have to pick every single one, but maybe write a goal down for this week. What, what would it look like to love God with my body this week? Or what would it look like to love God with my mind this week? What does that look like? Or what about my feelings, my emotions? What about, what about my desires? How can they be directed in a way that God desires for me? Or maybe even my failures. Maybe you've messed up this week. How can I love God in the midst of my failures? because of my flesh. How can I love God that way? Or how can I love God in the choices that I'm about to make? There's a lot of things to think about there, right? You don't have to pick all of them. Maybe pick one, maybe pick two, who knows? Write down a goal for this week. What does it look like to live that out? And then try it out and do it. Remember what you said last week? That part of believing, you know, in here is not just about like intellectually assenting to a Jewish person to, to believe, to live that out in action sometimes might actually walk you into the believing in your mind. It's just beautiful to try that out. So what does it look like to love God with your heart this week in one of those six areas or more than that? Remember, don't beat yourself up. Our hearts are fundamentally broken. And friends, it is through Jesus Christ that God writes the Torah, the law, upon our hearts as Jeremiah had hoped through the Holy Spirit. Listen to what the, writers of he, uh, what the writer of Hebrews says. The writer of Hebrews says, day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First he says, This is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. And then he adds, Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, Lev, and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts, our Lev's, sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how many we spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. God wants to transform our entire hearts. Moses says, circumcise that evil. Cut that stuff out. Why? Because he knows it destroys us. He wants to live the, us to live the flourishing life. And our hearts is everything. Our bodies, our minds, our feelings, our desires, our failures, our future choices, all of it. He wants us to put under him, to put him in the center because he's the one and only God. He's the true God. He's above all others. He's the only one worthy of worship as the beginning of the Shema says, right? Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. The Lord our God, the Lord is one, right? He is the Lord over all of it. So this week, what does it look like to love God with all of our heart? Because he cleanses us by his ahava, his love, our hearts. 
and his love that's poured out to us, he continues to show it with his actions. And now he's asking in the Shema for us to ahava, to love him with our body and mind and feeling and desires and, and failures and future choices, right? This is what we are declaring when we recite the Shema every single week. And Jesus says that all the scripture is summed up in that. Let's pray together. God, um, I ask that you would ignite everything, our heart, with the fire to love you with everything that we have, our body, our minds, our feelings, our desires, our failures, our future choices, God. Let us show it uh, by our actions. It is not like major, major actions, which are always good, but it's the little steps every day. Like we say in our mission, living the good news of Jesus seven days a week. It's seven days a week, God. Will you help us to love us with our all of our heart seven days a week? And let us give you all the honor as we experience the joy, the flourishing life, and point others to you. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said, amen. If you're able, stand and receive this good word, this word of benediction. May you love God with all of your heart, with all of your body, with all of your mind, with all of your feelings and desires and failures and future choices. May you live out these actions seven days a week and may you understand that the Lord Jesus Christ cleanses our hearts, transforms our hearts to live this flourishing light, the flourishing life. And may you love him with all of your heart this week in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And everybody said, Amen.